How do you do? For many people, the struggles of childhood can be overwhelming. So much so that they can't wait to finish school so they can move on and make a fresh start somewhere else. The man in our story planned to carry out this sort of escape, that is, until his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Found another box. Maybe your baseball glove is in here. Now stop looking out that window and help me unpack these moving boxes. There's a group of teenagers on the corner. They're fighting. Let me see. Oh, they're just wrestling. Maybe they have younger brothers you can play with later. Mom, can we go back to our old house? I already told you we can't. Why not? Because another family needs that space. I'm grateful the mission let us stay there as long as we did. I miss our old place. Me too, buddy. Lord knows where we'd be if we hadn't found that home and got the help we needed. What kind of help? Oh, help to heal our broken bodies and souls. That's miles behind us now. Right now, you need to focus on unpacking that big box and putting your clothes away. How come I never get my own clothes? They're yours now, plus they're worn in. Now get busy, and when you're done, you can go outside and make new friends. I don't want to. Why not? It's a sunny day. Maybe after Dad gets home and he's with me. Carl, there's nothing to be afraid of. Yes, there is. Those boys out there have chains and knives. I saw them. This is Unshackled, dramatizing true life stories produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Ever since our doors first opened in 1877, the mission has been a beacon of hope for the men, women, and children of Chicago's streets. Much has changed in the city since then. More people are homeless now, and they face new struggles that come with a changing world. We've even moved to different buildings over the years, but our foundation in love remains the same. And it is with this mindset that we offer, free of charge, hot nourishing meals, clean clothing, refreshing showers, and a safe bunk for poor and wandering souls to spend the night. Staff members speak to each guest one-on-one -on -one to learn the unique situation that brought them to the mission, while sharing with them the most important aspect of all, an introduction to the one who sticks closer than a brother, which is what this program celebrates. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is episode number 3813 in the series Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Like the man in our story, you may have grown up with your share of bullies at school or in your neighborhood. And you probably promised yourself that you would never, ever do what they did. But far too often, we find ourselves imitating those very behaviors. And chances are, we may not even realize it. We now bring you part one of the true testimony of Carl Priest, right now on Unshackled. I was that young boy you heard earlier, a skinny eight-year-old trying to fit in my new neighborhood. My well, first home was above a used clothing store run by the Union Mission in Charleston, West Virginia. Eventually, they moved us into a small house. My alcoholic dad and unwed mom were literally rescued by those kind mission folks. In time, we moved to Orchard Manor, a tough housing project on the west side of the city. It was rough living there, really rough. Street fights and crimes of all kinds happened there every day. Very few of those kids had a normal two-parent family, and those that did usually had at least one parent who drank. I suppose my friends just imitated the brokenness they saw in their parents and continued the pattern. Even though my parents were good, church-going people, that neighborhood had a strong influence on me. By the age of 10, I was smoking cigarettes, chewing tobacco, and skipping school. And with so many rough kids around, I was always getting into mischief or trouble with the police. After I graduated high school, I got a couple jobs, but goofed around too much and was quickly fired from both of them. 
But then a friend told me about an easy door-to-door -door job, handing out samples. So I jumped at the chance. <laughs> All right. Settle down. Settle down. On page two, you'll see last week's list of who made the most deliveries. Any questions? Yeah, Joe, what's the problem? Why is my name on the bottom of the list? I deliver way more paper than half these guys. <laughs> you call me a liar, boy? You ought to be paying me for the chance to work with these white boys. You hear me? Yes, sir. I hear you loud and clear. All messed up. I know, but nobody's saying anything. Okay, all right. Stop your muttering and pay attention. Now turn to page three and take a look hey, at- Hey, boss. Y you must have made a mistake on that delivery list. I know Joe made more deliveries than me and- What's your name, son? Carl. Carl Priest. Well, Mr. Priest, I never make mistakes and you need to keep your nose out of other people's business. You understand me? But he's right. I did do more. That's enough. You're fired, both of you. Leave your ID badges by the door and get out of here. Now! What a jerk. I don't know why we put up with him. Because we need to work. Someday, someone's gonna put old boss man in his place. Somebody needs to, but they gotta be smart about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I also know where he's working tomorrow. You want to pay him a visit? <laughs> you bet I do. He won't see what hit him. There he is, just up ahead. Yeah, I see him. Come on, let's get up behind him. Hey, mister, turn around. I got something for you. What? Ah! 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 Stop it! Leave me alone! Help! Somebody! Help me! Just a minute. Oh my, can I help you, officer? Sorry to bother you, ma'am. Is your son home? He's in trouble again, isn't he? Oh, never mind. I'll go get him. I'm right here, Mom. Go back to your TV show. Now, Carl, you do whatever he tells you. Don't worry, Mom. I ain't in trouble. Go watch your TV show. Hello, Carl. Officer Johnson, how are you? You know why I'm here? I don't know. You tell me. It's about that right fist of yours. Your knuckles look like you've been in a fight. Well, me, officer. I, I must have scraped it playing baseball when I, uh, slid into home base. That's so. Well, that catcher you ran into ended up in the hospital with a concussion and some cracked ribs. Says he can identify the person who did it. Oh, yeah? What are you gonna do about it? Write me a ticket? Nope. I've got a warrant for your arrest. I'm taking you to the station and booking you for assault. Come on, man. He deserved it. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. You crossed the line, son. Turn around while I cuff you. Ouch! Not so tough now, are you? Let's go. You can call a lawyer at the station. I couldn't afford a lawyer, so I represented myself. I guess the judge felt sorry for me because I ended up with only six months probation. I deserve worse, but was starting to believe I was invincible. That nothing could touch me as long as I never went too far, if you know what I mean. Looking back, I realized I had no purpose in life that summer. I just drifted aimlessly, open to whatever suggestions came my way. And a doozy came from my buddy, Bobby. Come on, Carl. We can be in Myrtle Beach in seven hours, buddy. We can go tonight, be there for the sunrise. Aren't you forgetting something? What? Neither of us have a car, and both of us are almost broke. So you tell me, how are we gonna get there? We'll hitchhike. Two handsome guys like us, every girl that drives by will want to give us a ride. Probably want to feed us, too. As long as we don't get picked up by some psycho, I'm in. We're almost there, buddy. I can't wait to put my feet in the ocean. How was uh, Mr. What's-His-Name in the back seat? Still passed out. Can't believe you talked me into hitching a ride with a drunk. That <laughs> worked out, didn't it? He was all too happy to let me drive. When we get there, let's find an all-night diner. I'm starving. Uh, our five bucks won't get us far. But I bet he's got a wallet full of dough. Don't even think about it. Why not? We'll knock him out with something. Take his wallet and leave him in a ditch. You crazy? Steal his car too? We can't do that. Sure we can. 
He's so drunk he won't even remember us. But what if we get caught? It's after midnight. Everybody in this town's asleep. I'm pulling over. Come on, Carl. Help me mug this guy. Hey, where are you going? I'm walking the rest of the way. It's not right stealing what ain't ours. You getting religious all of a sudden? Nobody's watching. You sure about that? Maybe God is. Maybe Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny are watching too. It just don't feel right. Beating up our old boss seemed right, but this guy, he don't deserve it. We need his money, don't we? No, we don't. Let's get out of here before he wakes up. Hold him down while I knock him out with this tire iron. No, Bobby, don't do it. We'll hear the rest of Carl's story in just a moment. But first, I want to share a bit about how our supporting ministry has an impact all over the world. Unshackled is spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we are able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there is one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check to Unshackled and mail it to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Just then, the man woke up, forced his way into the driver's seat, and drove away as fast as he could. Had we tried to rob him, I was certain we would have ended up in jail. Eventually, Bobby and I found rides back to West Virginia, and our big adventure was over. I tried attending the local college that fall, but that only lasted a few weeks. I was desperate to get as far away from Orchard Manor as possible, so I tried joining the Navy. The recruiter told me they already met their quota, but there was space in the Navy Reserve. So I signed up and went to Chicago for training. A few days later, a blizzard hit the Midwest and I spent my first week shoveling snow. Two hours on, two hours off, for 72 hours straight. After boot camp, I was ready to see the world, especially any place warmer than Chicago. I finished my training and got my orders. <laughs> so much for seeing the world. All I saw was the inside of a mess deck in Norfolk, Virginia. I worked 16 hours a day on the USS Wright, a floating command post for the Joint Chiefs and President in the event of a nuclear war. Stop slacking off, Carl. Break time was over 10 minutes ago. Lay off me and mind your own business. You ain't my NCO. What's gotten into you, man? You're always sitting around like the world owes you something. You're not my boss. I told you, leave me alone. And I told you, get up and start working like the rest of us. I said, Leave me alone! Yeah. Come on, get up! Get up. All right, you two, break it up! Break it up! I said break it up, Carl! He had it coming! Well, guess what's coming your way, seaman priest? Sink duty! For 76 days straight, I scrubbed the inside of every pot in that galley. I hated that punishment. But working by yourself gives a man lots of time to think, you know what I mean? What was I doing with my life? More importantly, why was I even born? Then I got this crazy idea to write an apology letter to the captain and ask his help in finding something more meaningful to do with my life. Priest, get over here. Yes, Chief? You got a lot of nerve, you know that? Sir? Writing a letter to the captain without going through chain of command. Well, I was only trying to- Did I give you permission to speak? No, sir. All right, pack your gear. You're off this ship as soon as we reach port. May I ask where I'm going, sir? For some reason, your apology letter impressed the captain. He's shipping you to an A school in Bainbridge. Hi. You must be the new guy. My name's Kevin. Priest. Carl Priest. How's the training going? Anything's better than working below decks. You got that right. Hey, listen. 
There's an off-base Bible study tonight. You want to join us? Sorry, I don't go to church. Used to with my parents when I was young, but that was a long time ago. I'm not into religion. Oh, oh, no, no, no. It's not about religion. It's, it's about having a relationship with the God who made us and discovering how much he loves us. He wants to be the Lord of our lives so we make better decisions and ultimately spend an eternity. Sorry, not interested. I like being in charge of my life. How's that working out for you? Man, you don't give up, do you? Let me ask you something. You Christians believe God created everything, right? Yeah, we do. But Darwin proved everything evolved from dirt, right? Okay, let me ask you a question. Who made the dirt? <laughs> I never thought about that. There's lots of things I don't have answers for. But one thing I do know for sure. Studying the Bible has changed my life. For the better. Why don't you give it a try? Come with me tonight. I don't know, man. We can leave right after supper. What do you say? For some reason, the word sure came out of my mouth. Looking back, I'm surprised how easily someone's life can be changed by just inviting them to church or a Bible study. Once I got there, I was greeted warmly by all the regulars who attended every week. They sang some songs that were vaguely familiar, and then someone led a Bible study from a book written by some guy named Paul. Afterwards, we ate some food, and then Kevin drove me back to the base. So what do you think about the Bible study? But a couple of the hosts that are pretty cool. You know, authentic. Not pretending to be better than everybody else or trying to sell you something. And what about the Bible verse we studied? Ha! <laughs> Which one? There were lots of them. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That one. I don't know, man. I mean, I've been in my share of fights and all, but deep down, I think I'm a good guy. I never killed anyone or robbed a bank. When I reach the pearly gates, God will take all my good stuff and weigh it against my bad stuff. That seems fair, don't it? That's not what the Bible says. Let me try to explain it this way. Say you put your dress white uniform on and all of it's clean. All of it. Except for one ink spot on the front. About the size of a dime. But the rest of the uniform is absolutely clean. You tell me, will that uniform pass inspection? No, definitely not. All of us are dirty, have a sinful nature, and need someone to clean us up before we meet a holy God. And his son did that for us. He took all our dirty sins on the cross when he died in our place, and it's up to us to accept that. So let me ask you, are you ready to do that? I told him I wasn't ready, not yet anyway. But he sure got me thinking about God and life and what happens when I die. A few weeks later, I made a trip to a local health club for my weekly swim. I sat in the sauna far longer than usual and felt lightheaded when I stumbled out. But I went for a swim anyway, cause that is what I always did. You okay, man? Yeah, I'm fine, just just stay in the sauna too long. Need some water. Cool me off. That guy's not coming up. Check on him. See if he's all right. I'm all right. I got it. I got it. I can do it myself. <coughs> you sure, bud? You almost drowned. Yeah, I'm good. That was the closest I'd ever come to dying, and it haunted me for days. What would I say if I met God? What would he say to me? Later that week, I decided to hang back in my barracks while the others went to the mess hall. I sat on the edge of my bunk and studied my white uniform hanging in my locker. I imagined a tiny black dot on the front of it, and as I remembered all the people I had heard and all the lies I had told, that black dot grew bigger and bigger. I realized that there was nothing I could do to clean myself up to meet God. Nothing. I knelt on the floor and talked to God for the first time in my life. Okay, God, you got my attention. I keep trying to ignore you, but you won't let me go, will you? All my life, I've bullied people and pushed them away from really knowing me. But you know me. All of me, even the ugly parts. To be honest, it's scary to think that you that, that you love me enough to let your son die for me. 
Jesus, I want you. No, I, I need you to forgive me and take control of my life. I don't know why I was born, but I trust that you'll show me. Jesus, I repent of all my sins and receive you as my Savior. I want you to be my Lord, the captain of my life. And that was the beginning of my new life as a Christ follower. After my enlistment was over, I went back to West Virginia where I enrolled in education classes at the college. After my morning classes were over, I drove 40 miles every day to my job at the post office. During the drive, I listened to this preacher on the radio who kept attacking the theory of evolution. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We were made in his image, born with an everlasting spirit. We did not evolve from some goo all the way to the zoo. Our parents were not monkeys. It was God himself who breathed life into the very first man and woman. When... Before I started listening to this man, I held what was called a theistic evolution position. I believe that God created the universe and then sat back and watched it evolve from some primordial soup, which meant the story of Adam and Eve was just a make-believe allegory of some kind. But the more I listened to this preacher, the more convinced I was that Darwin's theory of evolution had enough holes to drive a truck through. Even the planet we live on is mathematically impossible to sustain life without an intelligent designer behind it. I started asking my science professors some hard questions about the lack of transitional fossils and got lots of crazy answers and pushback, but those conversations always bothered me. Eventually, I graduated, married a wonderful girl I had met at school, and started looking for a teaching job. I'll give you one guess what door God opened for me. Yep. Out of all the schools in the entire state, he led me right back to Orchard Manor, a neighborhood I grew up in. You want to see me? Yes, please have a seat. <laughs> it's been a long time since I got called to the principal's office. I promise, no detention. <laughs> Let me begin by saying how grateful I am for your work all these years. What you've been able to do with these sixth graders is remarkable. There's been a significant drop in their trips to my office for conduct violations. Having a positive role model is making a huge difference for them. Well, thank you. It helps that I can relate to the same challenges that they face. I grew up in the housing project where they live. I'm guessing that's not the reason you wanted to see me. No, it's not. I'm concerned about the supplemental science booklets that the school board purchased. The ones about creation science? Well, the school board purchased those materials to provide an alternate view on evolution. I'm afraid we may be given the impression that we endorse someone's religious opinions. We're a public school, and the law clearly states that there's supposed to be a separation between church and state. But what law are you referring to? In the U.S. Constitution, you should know that. With all due respect, there's nothing in the Constitution that says there has to be a wall between government and religion. The First Amendment, which was added in 1791, says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. It's not about freedom from religion. It's about making sure that Congress doesn't enforce a national religion like England did in their past. But that doesn't change the fact that Darwin's evolutionary theories are a proven fact. And Every scientific theory is always open to intelligent criticism. It's never locked in stone. We simply can't be seen supporting religious viewpoints. All I'm doing is teaching students to think critically and answer the question, is it mathematically possible for the universe to exist by some evolutionary accident? Or did it require an intelligent designer behind everything? Both are valid questions. Aren't we supposed to be teaching them what to believe? I present both sides and then I let my students decide what they want to believe. I never force my personal opinion on them. So, with all due respect, I'll continue to teach opposing views. Then you'd better be ready for the storm that's coming your way. It may be more than you bargained for.
Join us again next week when we'll hear the conclusion of this powerful story. Like Carl, you may realize that you too need forgiveness for the sins in your life. And maybe you're beginning to realize that no amount of good works can ever earn your place in heaven. The Bible says that salvation is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Today, many people want to rewrite the Bible and suggest that sin isn't a big deal, that we're all good people who deserve to go to heaven. But Jesus said that God will judge us, not on our good works, but on what we did when his son offered us his free gift of salvation. How about you, listening friend? Have you begun a relationship with Jesus? If you're struggling with the guilt of your sins, we encourage you to run towards God, not away from him. If you need help in this critical decision, please call 1-888-NEED-HIM, or you can get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, unshackled.org. Did you know Unshackled is now offering new programming? That's right. We wanted to create even more quality Christian content for you, our listener. So we're now producing an exciting new children's show called The Clue Crew. This is a family-friendly adventure series where there's always a biblical lesson to be learned and a mystery to be solved. We're also bringing to life powerful gospel truths in a new series called History's Greatest Sermons. This program will feature the very words of Billy Sunday, Charles Spurgeon, Dwight L. Moody, and many more, all dramatized and delivered by our very own unshackled actors. And then there's our daily devotionals. In these three-minute episodes, we hear a true story of transformation with supporting scripture and an application point to help us dive deeper in our biblical understanding. If you'd like to hear any of these new programs in your area, we encourage you to reach out to your station manager and ask them if they can bring you The Clue Crew, History's Greatest Sermons, and Unshackled's Daily Devotionals. And finally, if you're interested in sharing your story with us, we'd love to hear from you. Just visit our main webpage, unshackled.org, and click the button, Submit Your Story. We collect testimonies from all over the world for the sake of sharing true examples of God's transforming power and we'd be happy to consider yours for a possible production. And next time... Dad? Amanda, Dan, what's wrong? My professor is the, the most aggressive, egotistical, God-mocking evolutionist I've ever met in my life. I'm sorry, honey. He treated God's words as if it was all made up. Carl Priest is convinced that Darwin's theory of evolution is filled with half-truths and contradictions. Our students deserve to know the truth. Evolution has lost its ability to answer emerging scientific discoveries. And scientific discovery always involves debate. It's the only way we decide between what's fact and what's speculation. But he faces an uphill battle with the State Board of Education for permission to teach his students the truth that only God could create our universe. You're on a fool's errand, Mr. Priest. At least I've spoken the truth. You ought to try it yourself sometime. It might be good for your soul, Mr. Bryant. Don't miss part two in the true testimony of Carl Priest, all on the next Unshackled. This is program number 3813. Heard in the true story of Carl Priest part one were Stephen Spencer, Angela Morris, Lynn Baber, Patrick Thompson, Ryan Priester, Evan Armacost, and Jacob Wilcoxon. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Patrick Thompson. Sound assistant, Jacob Wilcoxon. Audio engineer, David Perchinski. Script, Scott Kirk. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories that if your life is empty, it could be filled to overflowing. Please write today or reach out to us on social media. Connecting with you means a great deal to us. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Unshackled PGM. And our address, Pacific Garden Mission, 
1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory reminding you that the doors to Pacific Garden Mission are open night and day. Thanks for listening, and may God bless you.